Welcome to video 3 for week 9. In the previous video, I defined the notion of a partial derivative. In calculus 1, as soon as I defined the notion of a derivative, I used it to describe a differential equation for population and percentage growth, and used that as a motivating tool for the rest of the course, saying that one of the reasons we need derivatives is to describe processes that are described by differential equations. The same thing is true for partial derivatives, and you could argue it's even more fundamental that many of the basic operations that we observe in science, particularly in physics, but also in many other places, are described by partial differential equations. In this video, I want to walk through some examples to show you, now that we have defined what a partial derivative is, how partial differential equations are at the core of some physical processes. The examples in this course, or in this video, are going to be from physics, but there are partial derivatives in all areas of applied mathematics. So we're going to start with heat diffusion and talk about what is the heat equation, a partial derivative that describes how heat diffusion works, and also works for all sorts of other diffusion, um, chemical diffusion uh, in, in a solution, any kind of diffusion process. So we're going to do this in one dimension. So let's assume that we have a one-dimensional object uh, of length L, some kind of rod, and it has heat, that the heat can vary at different points. So it can be hotter or colder at different points in this one-dimensional picture and we want to know what happens to the heat over time. So we have a function that depends on the position on the rod and also depends on time, so a two-variable function that describes the heat. I'm going to need some starting information, and this is where partial differential equations become much, much more complicated. For differential equations of a single variable, we just needed one initial condition. Where does the whole system start? An initial population, an initial position, whatever the case was. Here we need much more. First, we need a boundary condition. We need to know what happens to the heat at the edges of the rod. And I'm going to assume that the temperature is fixed at zero at the edges of the rod, assuming that zero is the reference point for the ambient temperature of the system. So you scale our units so that the ambient temperature around this thing is zero, and we have some kind of sort of perfect heat sink so that the ends of the rod always stay at zero. So that tells me what happens at the edge of the system. I also need to know what happens at the start of the system. So I have some kind of initial heat distribution, some kind of function that tells me, oh, it's hotter here at the start, it's a little cooler here, it's a little warmer here, and then it goes back to zero. That's an initial heat distribution, and the question is going to be, what does that do over time? So let's look at an initial heat distribution in this figure and try and make an argument about what this is trying to do. So the idea is that heat wants to reach equilibrium, but it happens locally. So at a point like this, on either side it's cooler. So since on either side it's cooler, this wants to cool down. At a point like this, on either side it's warmer, this wants to on, this wants to increase in heat. At a point like this, it's cooler and warmer on one side and cooler on one side. Nothing's really going to happen. The key observation here that it's not the absolute value. This one is below. It's, it might want to increase. This one's above. It won't, won't want to decrease. But it's not actually the position above the global equilibrium. It's a very local question. The heat of the rod at this point is only really influenced by what happens exactly around it. So it's not the absolute value, it's not whether the heat is high or low, but the relative value compared to the points nearby. That's going to be measured by the concavity of the function. So this thing is concave down. And if it's concave down, that means the points nearby, this is more substantial uh, on the left than it is on the right, it's going to pull it down. If something is concave up, it's going to be pulled up. And this is an observation we can make. This comes from observational physics. If you have a heat distribution, places that are concave down want to diffuse downwards, and places that are concave up want to diffuse upwards. So, but concavity is measured by a second derivative, and that's a second derivative in the position. So this function is a function of position, so concavity is the second derivative of position. But if concavity causes diffusion, and concave down, which is negative, causes downward, downward diffusion. Concave up, which is positive, causing, causes upward diffusion. Then the change in time is going to be related to the concavity. Causes downward diffusion, 
it's going to cause an effect in time. This is called the heat equation. It says that the concavity of the heat distribution causes temporal change in the heat distribution. This is the standard setup for these partial differential equations. We're going to have a time derivative and a space derivative. The space derivative says something about the picture at a snapshot in time leads to an effect over time. In this case, the concavity and the, the greater the concavity, if I have something that's very, very concave, it's going to diffuse faster. If I have something that's not very concave, it's going to diffuse slower. So there's a proportionality. We'll take the most simple proportionality here. Just assume that the two things are directly proportional, the concavity and the change in heat distribution. Now, if my initial heat distribution is a sine function, pi x over l is going to just be one half of a period. So if I, my initial heat distribution, then the solution to this, which we're not going to talk about at all in this course of how to get, turns, to be, turns out to be exactly the same sine function with an exponential decreasing amplitude. So over time, this is going to diffuse down here, here, here. It can be the same function with a decreasing amplitude. And that makes sense. That's what we expect diffusion to do. So not only does this match our observation that concavity causes diffusion. It also fits the expected behavior that over time, this is where the time shows up, the amplitude of this heat distribution is going to get smaller and smaller, and in the end, in the limit, we get an actual flat equilibrium, which is exactly what we expect uh, heat diffusion to do. We expect it to level out and with no other heat added to the system to eventually equalize to equal heat everywhere as the heat has diffused across the entire system. There's this very similar equation called a wave equation. It again, again has a function. This function, instead of representing heat, represents displacement. So if I have a one-dimensional object like a string, I've got some kind of displacement along the string that changes in position and changes in time. Here the displacement is positive. Here the displacement is negative. And over time, this is going to change. The observation of this is the same, that the change to this displacement depends on concavity. But now the change is going to, the concavity is not going to diffuse. Diffusion is sort of a passive pro process where the heat sort of slowly ebbs away. With the wave equation, this concavity is going to cause an acceleration. An acceleration, according to Newton's first law, force equals mass times acceleration. An acceleration is caused by a force. So the force comes from the concavity. So this is almost the same equation, but now I have a second derivative on the left instead of a first derivative on the left. The time derivative is the second derivative indicating an acceleration instead of just a velocity of how quickly the heat will diffuse. I have an acceleration that tells me how the displacement will change over time. Again, if I start with a half period sine wave over the length of this displacement, the length of the string, then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the same sine wave, and I'm going to get an amplitude that changes. So instead of diffusing down, this is going to flatten to zero and then go negative to here, and then flatten to zero, and then go positive to here, and then flatten to zero and positive to here. It's going to oscillate back and forth exactly, exactly like a wave does. So the fact that this is an acceleration term means that the system is now self-propagating. It will oscillate up and down exactly like we expect a wave to. The key idea here is that this differential equation is the same setup. I have a spatial derivative on one side, and I have a temporal derivative on the other side, and something about the geometry tells me something about how it will develop over time. And in this case, I do, in fact, for certain nice initial conditions, get exactly what I expect, get some kind of propagation of a wave. I'm going to give you two other examples. There's a bunch of weird symbols on the screen here, so stick with me. These are not examples that we're going to work with. I just want you to be aware of them because they're such important partial differential equations. Uh, this is the famous Schrodinger equation, which is the fundamental equation of the first presentations of quantum physics in the 1920s and 1930s. Quantum physics depends on a state function, which is this psi here, and it depends on three variables of position and also on time. Um, 
i is the square root of negative 1, h bar is a constant. If I have a time derivative on the left, so the time derivative of this psi function is equal to some constant times the second space derivative, this nabla is a thing that we're going to define in a short while in a later video. It is a differential operator in three or more dimensions. So this is a second derivative in space. This v is some kind of potential energy function, so that's just multiplied by the wave function psi. So it's the same setup. I have space derivatives over here. I have time derivatives over here. So something about the geometry of the space derivatives tells me how the function will develop over time. That's the key. That's the heart of quantum physics in its original presentations. This Schrodinger equation tells you what the wave uh, function does over time, and then you get all your information above the, th above the physics out of that wave equation, which is changing over time according to this partial differential equation. Key idea is that the partial differential equation is the fundamental piece, the thing that tells you how everything works. One more partial differential equation, this is the Navier-Stokes equation, which is the fundamental equation for fluid dynamics. So this function v is the velocity field for a fluid. It tells you at each point in a fluid what the velocity of that fluid is, what direction it's going and how quickly it's going. It depends on three variables and time. So think about currents in the ocean, think about currents in the air, think about any other type of fluid situation where things are moving around. You want to know at each point in the fluid, where is it moving, how quickly is it moving. We have a complicated differential equation called the Navier-Stokes equation. Let me define all these pieces for you. I have a time derivative over here. I have the space derivative again over here using this weird differential operator nabla, which again isn't defined here, but just trust me for now that it's a differential operator with x, y, and z derivatives. Uh, this is the um, fluid density. This is the pressure. This is a weird thing called the stress tensor, and F is some external force. So you've got a bunch of other things happening. How dense is the fluid? How much pressure is on there? What force is being applied? And you get this complicated partial differential equation. And I don't need you to understand all the pieces of this partial differential equation. Again, I'm just demonstrating that fluid dynamics, which is a whole huge area of mathematics and physics, very important area, all is governed by one really, really complicated, but really, really important partial differential equation. And it has the same setup. It has time derivatives on one side and space derivatives on the other. The takeaway for this whole video, we're not going to solve partial differential equations in this course. I'm not really even going to ask you much about them. But now that we've defined a partial derivative, I want you to understand the importance of that definition and how it, it serves as the way to define the fundamental ideas in all of these places in physics, how heat and diffusion works, how waves work, how quantum mechanics work, and how fluid mechanics work.